Hello, this is Bryant Myers, author of PMF, The Fifth Element of Health, and this is the second video in our physics review series where we're going to give you the basic science that you need to understand PMF therapy and to help to expose the bad science that's out there, which I call PMF BS. Let's get right into it. This video, we're going to look at electrostatics or charges at rest. Now, you might not realize it, but you do have an intuitive understanding of static electricity. For example, when you comb your hair and there's crackles and your hair stands up a little bit, when you open your dryer and pull sheets apart, you can hear the static electricity and sometimes see sparks if it's dark. Or like in your bed, you know, if you just made your bed with freshly dried sheets. Uh, when you're walking across the carpet and you touch somebody, you give them a shock, that's static electricity. And of course, the most obvious example is lightning. When you see lightning, that is a huge burst of electrostatics from the ionosphere to the surface of the Earth. From ancient times, people were familiar with different types of phenomena that today would be explained using the concept of electric charge. For example, lightning, uh, electric fish like electric eels, electric ray, torpedo fish, St. Elmo's fire, which is the corona discharge coming off the top of a ship, the mast at the very top, which you could see as a glow in the distance, and amber rubbed with fur, would attract small light objects. Actually, it's been recorded that Thales of Miletus around 640 BC rubbed amber, which is fossilized tree sap, and discovered it would attract leaves. In fact, amber is called electron in Greek or electrum in Latin, so the word electron comes from amber. Today we know that electric charge is the physical property of matter that causes it to experience a force when placed in an electromagnetic field. There are two types of electric charges, positive and negative, commonly carried by protons and electrons respectively. Like charges repel and unlike charges attract. An object with an absence of a net charge is referred to as neutral, like a neutron. Now by some strange convention, electrons were given a minus sign by Benjamin Franklin. He's the one that made electrons negative. The first interesting thing is that every electron anywhere in the universe has exactly the same charge, has exactly the same mass, and protons too. At the microscopic level, they're identical. And there are something like 10 to the 80 atoms in the universe, and many, many more protons and electrons, and they're all identical. I find this absolutely fascinating. Secondly, charge is conserved. Conservation in physics is a term which means something that does not change with time, or something that has neither created nor destroyed. So charge is definitely a conserved quantity. Thirdly, charge is quantized. That is, charge is granular, not continuous. It comes in individual multiples of small units called the elementary charge, which is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 columns. And columns is the SI unit for a measurement of charge. I also find really interesting that even though protons are 1,800 times more massive than electrons, they both have exactly, to as many decimal places as you can take it, the same charge, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 columns. If this were not the case, the universe as we know would not exist at all. They have to be the same, even though their masses are very different. And this is how the periodic table of elements, how all the atoms there are balanced, because you have equal number of protons and equal number of electrons in a balanced atom. Now the electrostatic force, here's a little experiment you can do and I have a little video clip here of somebody combing their hair and picking up some pieces of paper. This might not seem all that impressive, but it's really a big deal because what's happening is that the force of electricity is triumphing over the gravitational force of the entire mass of planet Earth. When you comb your hair, you're rubbing electrons onto the comb, and those electrons are polarizing charges in the paper and pulling the paper up and overcoming gravity. And the Earth, of course, is an enormous mass. It's around six sextillion metric tons. So we're talking about a little tiny comb overcoming the entire mass of the planet. The reason for this is the electromagnetic force is more than a trillion, trillion, trillion times stronger than gravity. The only reason that gravity wins cosmically on large scales is that almost everything in the universe is electrically neutral. Colum's law is an exact formula derived from experiment that allows us to calculate this electrostatic force between two or more charged particles. So the force is proportional to the product of the charges 
and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. The constant of proportionality k is 1 over 4 pi times epsilon naught. Where epsilon naught is the electric permittivity constant in free space, we'll see a little later that the permittivity constants for different materials kind of tells you how much that material will shield the electric field or the electric charges. In free space, that shielding is going to be minimal, meaning the electric field will have its strongest effect in a vacuum or free space. Now, it's actually much more practical to work with the field formulation using the electric field. The reason is that whereas Q1 and Q2 are two charges, exist only at those two places, a distance r between them, the electric field can be defined everywhere. So we defined force as equal to Q times this electric field. That is to say, the electric field is simply Colomb's law divided by one of those charges. So E is the electric field of the source charge. And notice that it's a function of position because the separation r depends on the location of the field point. What exactly is an electric field? Now, James Clerk Maxwell identified the field as the space around an electrified object, a space where electric forces act. Each electric charge produces in its vicinity an electric field that exerts a force on another charge, kind of just like the smell of a skunk repels or perhaps attracts other animals. So this field is like the sound of one hand clapping. You don't need two charges, just one. Now, field formulation does away with action at a distance and is very powerful in all areas of physics, where forces are mediated by the field, and the field produces the force. The common thread running through most attempts to define the electric field is that the fields and forces are closely related. Here's a pragmatic definition. An electric field is the electrical force per unit charge exerted on a charged object. Although philosophers debate the true meaning of the electric field, practical problems can be solved by thinking of the electric field at any location as the number of newtons of electrical force exerted on each column of charge at that location. The units of electric field are newtons per column or volts per meter. Electric fields are created by electric charges and also by time varying magnetic fields, as we'll see. So really all we're doing here is taking columns on, we're dividing by Q. And that gives us the field at any point in space, not just between two points. It's helpful to visualize the electric field in the vicinity of a charge object. So try to get used to this field formulation because we're going to be using it in electric fields, magnetic fields, and even light. If you think back to your middle school science classes where you poured iron filings around a magnet, you could really see the magnetic field around the bar magnet, right? So even if you're not able to follow everything I'm saying, just try to get an intuitive understanding of this idea of an electric and magnetic field. Now the electric field flows out from a positive charge and it flows in towards a negative charge. The number of arrows pointing out gives you an indication of the strength of the field. So you can see from this image here, there are less arrows pointing out from A than B and there are less arrows pointing out from B than C. So can you guess which one of these three has the strongest electric field? If you answer C, you are correct. So you can see there are more arrows pointing out, which is basically a density of these electric field lines. And the greater the density of the field lines, the greater the strength of the electric field. Does that make sense? And just to be clear, by density of field lines, I'm talking about the number of lines crossing a surface perpendicular to the lines divided by the area of that surface, which gives you the density of the lines. Just refer to the image I just showed where you can see that C has a greater density than B has a greater density than A. So that gives you a real good visual of what it means to have a greater density of electric field lines. So we're now going to talk about Gauss's law, which is more or less saying the same thing as Colomb's law. It's just more mathematically powerful in many situations. But before we do, we need to understand the idea of electric field flux. And to understand flux, it's helpful to visualize water flow. So you can think of a faucet, which water is flowing out, as like a positive charge. Only positive charges, the electric field is flowing out. But interestingly, the mathematics is very similar to both fluid flow and electric field flow. So it makes a very good analogy. A negative charge where the field is flowing in is kind of like a drain, where the water is flowing into a drain. So you got a source and a sink, a faucet flowing out, which is the positive charge, and the water draining in or going into a negative charge. And the greater the flow of water, so if you turn your faucet way, way up, you're going to have a stronger flow, right? 
that's equivalent to a stronger electric field flow or flux. When I say flux, just think of flow. Besides electric field flowing out of a positive charge and into a negative charge, we're just talking about point charges there, you can also have like a line of charge, a sheet of charge, a sphere of charge, and you can have what's called a dipole where you have a positive and a negative charge where the field lines are flowing out from one and into the other. Again, just try to get an intuitive feel for this idea of electric fields. You can always think back to iron filings around a magnet and kind of fluid flow from a faucet in a sink or a hose. And it just gives you a good analogy or a good way to visualize the electric field. Now Gauss's law for electric fields relates the spatial behavior of the electrostatic field to the charge distribution that produces it. Because sometimes it's not just as simple as a point charge as we mentioned. Now it gives the same result as Coulomb's law, but like I said, it's much more powerful in many situations. So simply put, it states this, the electric charge produces an electric field and the flux or the flow of that field passing through any closed surface is proportional to the total charge contained within that surface divided by the electrical permittivity. So the electric field flux or flow through any closed surface is really a measure of the electric sources in that enclosed volume. So that is to say, if you put, say, a surface around a faucet, well, that would be a source of fluid flow. If you put a surface around charges, that'll be a source of electric field flow. Now, if there are no source charges and the field lines are just kind of flowing in one side and out the other, then the flux will be zero. And here's a few examples of zero fluxes where you have fields going through a surface, but there's no source charges, meaning there's no positive charges where electric fields flowing out, and there's no negative charges where the electric fields are flowing in. So basically, it sounds complicated, but it's a little easier than it sounds, at least in theory. The analogy of fluid flow is very helpful in understanding the meaning of flux of a vector field, such as the electric field. You can think of the flux of the vector field over a surface as the amount of that field that flows out through the surface. So a spherical source would be like a point source of water spraying at a constant rate water out in all directions. If you put a spherical transparent balloon around that point source, the total amount of water hitting the surface of the balloon is going to be constant regardless of how big you make the balloon. Can you understand that? It's because the amount of water is the same. I mean, if you have a smaller balloon, it'll feel like the pressure is much greater, but it's still the same amount of water as if you had a bigger balloon with lower pressure in a larger area. Does that make sense? So flux is like the total amount of water flowing out where the electric field strength or magnetic field strength is kind of like the water pressure on that balloon I talked about at a particular point. So basically the electric flux is the electric field integrated over the entire surface under consideration. And then we can calculate the electric field by setting the total electric flux equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught and solving for E. And the reason we can solve for E is that the surface we choose, the electric field strength is going to be the same at every point. So for example, a sphere around a point source, it's the same R on every point, right? So a sphere has a constant radius from that point charge. If it's a line of charge, then it's going to be a cylinder, and every point on the cylinder will be the same electric field. So this is why Gauss's law is so powerful, because when you choose a symmetric surface, you can calculate both the total flux and the electric field on any point on that surface. So let's use the simplest example, just one point charge. We'll just make it a positive charge. To surround that positive charge, doesn't it make sense to use a sphere as a symmetrical surface to surround the charge, such that at any radial point from the charge to the surface of the sphere, it's going to be the same distance. That means that the electric field is going to be constant on any point on that surface. And because of that, we can use Gauss's law. So we integrate the surface, which the area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. So we have E times 4 pi r squared equals Q enclosed over epsilon naught. And solving for E, we get Q enclosed over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared, which indeed is Coulomb's force law. So it does give the same result. So Gauss's law and Coulomb's law are going to give you the same answer. It's just Gauss's law is more powerful and easier to solve for symmetrical charge distributions like points, lines, planes, etc. Now a point source is the easiest to solve, and we could certainly have used Coulomb's law. But let's say we had an infinite line of charge or an infinite sheet of charge 
or a spherical solid sphere of charge? Well, in those cases, we can use Gauss's law and the results, I'm not going to derive them, but we'll end up with a 1 over R drop-off from the electric field from an infinite line of charge. From an infinite plane of charge, there is no drop-off at all because you can never escape an infinite plane. Can you kind of visualize that? Because the higher you go up, the more charges kind of come into view or come into play. And a ring of charge gives you a 1 over 3 halves drop-off, and that's actually easier to use Colum's law to solve. I just need to briefly mention that I'm talking about uniform charge densities here because otherwise we've got to get into some complicated calculus. The main point that I want you to take home here is that even though Colum's law is a 1 over r squared law, notice that the field drop-offs are not always 1 over r squared drop-offs. In fact, most of the time they're not. It's only for point charges and spherical charge sources that you get a 1 over r squared drop-off. Like a line of charge is 1 over r, an infinite sheet of charge, there is no drop-off, and a ring of charge is a 1 over 3 halves drop-off, which depends on both the radius of the ring and the distance from the center of the ring. Put this in your back pocket for now, but we're going to come back to this later because it does relate to some real PEMF BS when it comes to bad science in the PEMF community because a lot of high-intensity companies are using a 1 over R squared drop-off from a current loop, which is just wrong, wrong, wrong. What's really interesting to me is that regardless of whether you use mass, charge, current, or a light source, these drop-offs are the same for the different geometries that I mentioned. For example, if you have a line of mass, a line of charge, a line of current, or a line of, say, like a fluorescent light bulb, a line of light, you get a 1 over R drop-off from that source, again, because of the cylindrical geometry. And if we have a ring of mass, a ring of charge, a ring of current, or a ring of light, all those intensities drop off by a 1 over 3 halves law. So again, it's not a 1 over R squared, even though they are all 1 over R squared laws. And the reason is you have to integrate over the source charge, the source mass, the source light, or the source current. When you put all these equations side by side, I just got goosebumps when I saw it. It's like, wow. All these inverse squared laws have the same form depending on their source distribution. And with regards to PMF therapy, we almost always deal with current loops. In this case, we're talking about a ring of charge or a ring of current, which is a 1 over 3 halves drop-off. And I'm going to do a separate video at some time to really show this because it is just so fascinating to me. Again, just put that in your back pocket for now. But the main thing in this video was understanding electric charge, what an electric field is, and how you can use both Colum's law and Gauss's law to calculate and visualize the electric field at any point in space. Thanks for watching. In the next video, we're going to put charges in motion and look at simple circuits and ideas like voltage, current, capacitance, power, and things that relate to very simple circuit theory.